everybody. Uh, and I guess Mark is going to speak first, right? Uh, um, my name is Marika Fisher-Hoyt. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the artistic director of Bach Around the Clock and so delighted that my friend and colleague Trevor Stevenson has <laughs> agreed to speak with us this evening. I'll give you a little bit of background about his history. He, is, uh, he plays harpsichord, forte, piano, and piano. He got his DMA in historical performance of the 18th century music from Cornell in 1990, founded Madison Bach Musicians in 2004 and serves as artistic director of that, has done ever since it was founded. He has released 16 recordings on the Light and Shadow label and he tours the US as a performer and lecturer. So we are in the happy position of benefiting from one of his lectures right here in Madison. So oh, I'll turn it over to you, Trevor. Thank you so much, Marika. It's great to see you. It's great to see everybody. Any, you know, unless you're in your worst pajamas, please, yeah, if you want to, I'd love to see your faces, you know, um, or even in your worst pajamas. <laughs> so, as I, so anyway, it, it, it is nice. A, a little bit of facial feedback is wonderful, you know, as we go, right? So, um, and uh, so this is a, a talk on the Goldberg variations. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes on, uh, 40 minutes on the variations and uh, you know, when Bach wrote them, kind of maybe things that came before it, uh, maybe perhaps what he was trying to set out to do. And mostly I want to aim at the, the structure of the set. Uh, it's a unique work in starting with the long aria and then giving you 30 variations and then having the aria return in its original form. Um, and as Peter Williams said, you can actually at the end of the Goldbergs play the aria exactly the same way that you played it at the beginning. And the effect is just as crushing. So, you know, uh, no, I mean, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, but it's, it is important. It, it's, you know, it's, you don't even have to alter it or decorate it in a different way. It's, it, it is a, a profound work. And I thought that'd be a wonderful piece to talk about the, the concept of the eternal return, which is of course, you know, uh, all over, you know, Western uh, art and, and world art for that matter. Um, uh, and this is Bach, the only time where he does it really, he does it wholesale. And I, I thought we'd, we'd look at that and see why it's so successful. Of course, it's, it's always a joy to, you know, analyze what works, you know, uh, as, as opposed to the opposite. So anyway, um, J.S. Bach, you know, he was in his early 50s, around 1740, 1741, he starts to write the Goldberg Variations. Of course, you know, Bach didn't keep a journal. We don't know really when he started to write anything. And we also know that he was, you know, usually working on 10 to 20 projects at the same time. Uh, he had that kind of mind uh, with an IQ of whatever million and I'm sure it was he, it, for him, he could do it. Um, so, uh, but somewhere in there, he, he launched into this set of variations. And, and one of the things that's got, kind of interesting are things that, uh, you know, anticipate it. Uh, there's a couple of works, uh, one by Handel, one by Buxtehuda, and, and then there's also Scarlatti's Esercizi that, that are all things that Bach probably knew and uh, they have a, a bearing on the, the shape of these variations. So uh, Dietrich Buxtehude, of course, comes from a, you know, a generation or two. He's two generations older than J.S. Bach. He was a revered organist and music director up in Lübeck. And when Bach was you know, 19, 20 years old, he took off on foot uh, several hundred miles uh, to get to Lubeck. I mean, I'm sure he hitched a ride on the stagecoach once in a while, but he did, you know, he was very industrious and he got up there and he, and, and he, he heard books to Huda. Books to Huda was quite old at the time. Uh, there's a chance that, that Bach was even offered the job um, and Handel had been offered the same job that both these young Bucks born in the same year had showed up within a year of each other, great musicians. Um, but uh, neither of them took the job and that there's a, a, long, a long story associated with that. But Books to Huda's music is a, an important link to the 17th century uh, and Bach was very aware of Books to Huda's great style and Books to Huda wrote a set of variations in G major, 32 variations on a theme called La Capricciosa. Uh, and, and it's a very short theme. The piece goes by in a few minutes, but there it is. It, it, it's in it's in G. It it has a similar format to the Goldberg variations, and 
You should know it exists, and Bach probably knew it. Uh, Bach also, uh, of course, it was been acquainted with a published piece by Handel, which is the Chacon and 62 variations, a very short Chacon, um, uh, but in a typical kind of a Handel, he's just riffing on this, this bass line. Uh, but let's see, now I'll try screen share one. Oh, here we go, into the valley. Um, oh, I want to, how do I share when it's not already up there? <laughs> okay, hang on. Um, can you see the, uh, hang on, there. This is Buxtehuda. Everybody see this? So, yeah, La Capriciosa. Everybody see this? So there's the piece. Um, we know that Bach, when he came back from Lübeck, that he was he had copied off of piles of Buxtehuda's music. In those days when things weren't published, the way you got it is you just sat down, you know, and, and uh, with your beer or whatever and copied it, copied it out, which I'm sure that they did gladly. So there it is, and there are 32 parts to this. Here's, I'm gonna, handles. Now you're still seeing the books to Huda, right? Correct? No, handle now, the Chacon. You did, you did see handle. Can you see handle Chacon in G major? Right now. Thank you, and I'm sorry for my my chops on screen share. We'll get there, and I'll quit sharing so quickly. But I just wanted you to see this. Here's the handle, Shakon. Look how short this this is. That's it, eight measures, and then off he goes. Right, but similar, some similar techniques to the Goldbergs. Not nearly the emotional range or depth that Bach. I mean, Bach is, of course, you know, really setting out to write King Lear and you know everything else all at the same time. Uh, right, but. But still notice just one thing, look at the baseline here. Because remember the Goldberg variations is really a set of variations, not on a melody, but on a baseline. And this, this baseline in Handel is quite similar. Dropping by the half step, then rounding the corner, then it makes it, the climax comes when the C hits in the bass, and then he works his way out. And we're gonna see Bach just elaborate on that in 32 measures, but it, it, it's, it's the same idea and it's the same key. So it, it, I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, and then the other piece of course is uh, Scarlatti published his 30, the only thing that Scarlatti ever published of his keyboard music is 30 Esercizi, um, which uh, is 30, again, 30 pieces. It really opens up the world of virtu a new kind of virtuosity at the keyboard. Uh, it's published three years before the Goldbergs are published. Um, so Bach probably would have been you know, acquainted with it. And the funniest thing about the SFGC is that it's all these virtuoso hand crossing pieces, much of the technique of which Bach uses. The 30th piece in Scarlatti's is the only fugue in it. And in Bach's Goldberg variations, the 30th piece, which is supposed to be the canon or fugue at the 10th, is not a fugue. It's, the only, it, it, it's where Bach breaks the pattern, and it's where Scarlatti goes the other way and says, okay, I'll write a fugue, you know? Um, and that's the famous Katz fugue. So anyway, I'm just, it doesn't really tell us a lot about the material at hand, but it shows you that these people are, they are aware of each other. Um, so anyway, there it is. Now, tell me... Tell me what you see now. Do you see an old manuscript, uh, old publication? Okay, so the screen share, it is just flipping as I go. Okay, wonderful. Let's go up to the top. Bach published the Goldberg Variations. This is the original title page to it. Can everybody see this is Klavier Übung, right? Uh, and this is an aria. Uh, with uh, with va variations, you know, with an assorted variations, <laughs> variations of variations, right? Um, for harpsichord with two manuals. It's one of the only pieces Bach wrote where he actually says in the piece, 
it's for a harpsichord. It's not just keyboard, like clavier is, is either, you know, clavichord or keyboard in general, generic keyboard. He, this is actually harpsichord. Um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, he goes out of his way. He also specifies two manuals because in the work, he, he tells you when you're, you need to use two manuals. There are other pieces where it's optional to use two manuals and then other pieces where he recommends just using one. But there it is. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a lovely title page. Uh, you, many of you probably know that Bach, this is all published on his own dime. This is nobody... Nobody was asking for this. He was just publishing it. He's getting older. This is the fourth volume of his keyboard music that he published called the Clavier Ubung. Uh, it started with the Partitas Volume 1, the French Overture and the Italian Concerto Part 2, the Organ Chorale Preludes, the incredibly complex virtuosic organ writing in Part 3, and now the Goldberg Variations is the last set. This this particular copy that you're looking at here, the, the this you know photocopy P, P, through the miracle of PDF and screen sharing, you know, was found in France in 1974. There were hard, very few copies of the Goldberg Variations printed when Bach printed it, just a few hundred. That, so far as we know, this one was from Bach's own library, and this is the copy he received and mar and then marked up after it got back from the publishers, because no matter how many drafts you go through, there's always mistakes or whatever. But Bach being the unbelievable, you know, so you can see it, in here there are little bitty ornaments and dashes in red that you'll see uh, where Bach has written in. I think sometimes it's in red, sometimes not. Um, you know, but this is the, his own edition. Most importantly, I'm gonna hook, sorry, don't get a stomach ache with me flying around like this. At the very end, he puts in 14, the, he, he actually writes this into the book. He probably had his little thing that made staff lines and he printed it on and in the empty pages at the back of the book. And he put in 14 new canons that he had thought of since it had gone off to the publisher to be published, right? I always say, you know, what a great geek this man was, right? And, and of course, these are much more cryptic canons. That is, he does, they're puzzle, they're puzzle canons. He doesn't, they're not written out like they are in the main body of the Goldbergs, but these are, you know, ones that, that have to be solved. And some of them are, are quite complicated. Uh, and they're like, they're almost like math puzzles. The thing is that they, when they're solved, they make great music. There's a lovely recording of this by uh, Musica Antiqua of Cologne, and Reinhard Goebel. What truly one of the great recordings, you can go get it on YouTube, um, but they recorded these 14 canons. Canon number 13, right here, the triplex, this guy, canon triplex, is the canon that, and I'll, I'll see if I can possibly do this, um, in the, the only portrait we have of Bach from life, he is, do you see this? You see a portrait of Bach? Ah! All right, new share, hang on. Now do you see a portrait of Bach? This famous portrait painted from life in 1747 uh, of him, uh, probably for his uh, entry into the mathematical and uh, uh, society there in Leipzig of Meisler. He is holding this Goldberg variation Canon 13, holding it upside down toward you. Is right, um, and this portrait is now back in Leipzig. It was in the United States for many years, of course, uh, in New Jersey with, with Bill Scheide. So anyway, and then here's the canon over here. If you can see where I pointed, this is you know right off of that manuscript. And then here's the sol here's a solution to it. Okay. Um, anyway, it's it's fun and it makes it's lovely music. Uh, it's funny when you listen to these fourteen canons; they sound almost more like. Hindemith and German neoclassical 20th century music than, than anything else, but in a very light vein. So there they are. We'll go back to the Goldbergs. Um, I'm going to try to now just to go to the score and see if we can do this. Tell me if, uh-oh, do you see the, the uh, printed Goldberg score right now? Nope. New share. Hang on. 
Okay, and now we'll stay with this for now. You do. Do you see black and white variation one Goldberg score? Okay, so now we're gonna we'll stay here and we're gonna walk through the Aries. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of background and and things that are that were happening with it. Was was that all just clear as mud, everybody? <laughs> was that good? Anyway, I hope hopefully a little bit of context. Um, and it's it's kind of neat, I think, to see that picture of him holding that little cannon out towards you. Yeah. And of course, the fact that it's upside down or what is they love that things had to work inside out, upside down. And the Goldberg variations itself is full of cannons that that were, where they work in inversion and things work forward and backwards. I mean, he just he loved that. So here's here's where it starts. It's it, it calls it an aria, which means song. Uh, and it is. If you want to geek out on the numbers, it's 32 measures long, and there are 32 pieces to the the set. Um, and it's in this you know elegant kind of a sarabande almost feeling. Uh, sarabands typically uh, repeat the first note like that. Uh, this is a, a very uh, incredibly elaborate kind of a, a sarabande with you can see the ornaments are all over the place. Um, one of the things, the miracles of Bach is no matter how many ornaments there are, and these he indicates all these, somehow the simplicity of it is never lost. Those are in the words of Claude Debussy. He said, Bach, no matter how complex Bach, Bach gets, the, the, the idea is never lost, right? Which is truly, I, that's the thing that I think keeps me coming back. Uh, the diffusion of complexity and simplicity, which is, I think, where I'd like to end up going with this. So here's the aria. And I think, I mean, I, there are other pieces that do this. But when we all hear this music, the, the emotion that this very opening generates, you know, it's, it's really quite, it's amazingly powerful. I don't know how he knew to separate the melody from the left hand by two octaves instead of one. You know, I mean, any idiot would have put it at one, but, you know, but, but give, there's a huge sense of space. And I think also a, a, perhaps he's indicating a wide frame that's going to be coming with a double octave that the, and the space in between. Also, by repeating the first note, I, I think it you, you can feel yourself relax. You cast back. I, I, I would even argue that there's a sense of of memory and going back and opening the old photo album or whatever, even in this in the opening two measures of this piece, um, and which which is where it will all end up, you know, coming back to itself, but with new even greater understanding from the the journey that's been had. Um, probably, if, you know, it's a Wizard of Oz structure, something like that. Um, you know, it's coming back to the beginning. So here it is, and you know, just a couple of uh, things. Notice the dropping bass line. Um, again, it's important to know the Goldberg Variations is not a set of variations on a theme. It's a set of variations on a bass line and its implied harmonies, okay? Um, John Butt, the great critic said, any one of these variations could be the theme. There's no, there is no theme, right? Uh, and it's part of its genius is that it's based upon this sub, it's the subtext that holds it all together or the, the lower part driver like that with this elaborate melody on top. Notice also it drops an octave. First thing here on a harpsichord, an octave is a, is a, is a you know, a gamut of a life kind of thing. Uh, the difference between these two Gs, it's really big, you know, and, and, uh, coming down here sounds like you've changed from a soprano to a real mezzo at, at this point. Um, another an, an important thing is that he gets, after he does his first four bars of this melody, I, th I think it even becomes more reflective as you get into the second half right over here, excuse me, after the first eight bars. The, in this, you, Bach is doing his old metaphysical uh, kind of technique of all seeming to show you the inside of the inside, something like a emotionally like the Russian dolls, where it's always the thing that's inside another thing that's inside another thing. But there's, I, I and I, I'm just, I'm going to be unashamed in my emotional analysis of this. I, I want to talk about how the feeling morphs as you go through the theme. So I, I'm just, I'm saying that I think it's more of a sense of interiority here. OK, um, as you go through the second eight bars, the whole set of variations is constructed with this uh, after the 16th bar. There's a repeat sign. 
it's a great idea to take the repeats. And of course, when you do take the repeats, you you find yourself back at the beginning, you know, uh, which again is what the whole set is going to do. Um, emotionally, in the second half, uh, it's there's even more kind of a uh, maybe a sense of me, mess, mesto, interior trouble, and 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 maybe heartache, especially as he goes through the key of E minor. You know, it's, it was an important key to him. Uh, and of course, the St. Matthew Passion, it's really the home key of that piece. But um, the, it's really extremely tender uh, and qu is quite far afield from the opening affect. Where, you know, it's funny, in the 18th century, one of the things af after Bach is dead and the new style, the classical style is coming, that writers prided themselves on how the new style had the greatest transportation of affect between the highs and the lows and and the you know the the happy and the sad and all that but bach in my opinion bach has the greatest transportation of affect but he does it so smoothly in getting from the light into the deepest of the dark that you never pick up how it's been done like that but but the sorrow and the weeping that are here in e minor how did he get there from this incredible joy and 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 reflective open quality of the beginning so um i i just want i think bach was the, the the greatest in showing emotional range it's just he's so good at it he was never really given credit for it you know um anyway so there's the theme most importantly i, I just want to point out one other thing all, since everything is based on uh, the, the baseline, when this C comes in right here, okay, after the troubled section, there is a sense of the ice being broken, of, of the grief being uh, beginning to, you know, uh, dissolve like that. And, and there's a, is a feeling of hope. And, and as it breaks up, you notice that the right hand begins to move in continuous 16th. There's a sense of fluidity here that has not been in any of, of the previous sections, right? And, and I, I just think there, there's something about that ambulation and the freedom to move, which uh, is really important in this piece. Uh, and it's always signaled by the mo motion to the C in the bass here at this, at this point, three quarters of the way through. If it were a five act play, it would, you know, at the end of the fourth act, beginning of the fifth act kind of thing, which is always that, that pivotal moment. Um, and then it, it, you know, it ends very quietly. You'll notice he does a wonderful trick here. See, see these last few notes where the tonic leading tone and then back to tonic of the last three notes of the, of the theme is exactly the way the first variation starts on the same pitches precisely, but in a completely new affect. So I, I think what he's doing you know, he gives you a sense of reflection and a, a great, the, the great passage of time and life and all of that. And then variation one is almost like going back to being 15 years old, right? Uh, and this is an explosion of youthful energy. And notice that the, the, it's bouncing. The left hand is leaping all over the place like that. Um, kind of neat how he fuses that or pushes that against scale-like motion here in the right hand so that you have one hand with with this kind of motion and then the other part is moving like this uh, at the same time like that it, it it's his way of of getting the getting it to stick together like that and not have both hands jumping at the same time we'll see that later um but just it's neat it's neat how bach builds a pastry is all i'm getting at you know um Anyway, so and for the layers, it, now you get your first flavor, uh, first taste of the of the hand crossing. This is a particularly interesting one. Um, uh, Note and Bach actually says play this on one keyboard. So uh, look what happens right here. The right hand dives down into the middle of the left hand. This is a this is fat finger crisis zone, right? If you have fat finger, right? Uh, it, and while the left hand is running, so. Uh, anyway, it's it's hard, and after ten thousand repetitions, it's still hard, but it gets a little easier. Anyway, um, it's it's a wonderful and highly energetic variation, uh, and it ends like most of the variations, not never with chords or hardly ever with chords, but always with the single note. Yeah, and there might be a couple with with harmonies, but I think it's almost always noted as single note. And you know who else ends 
everything with a single note. It's Domenico Scarlatti, right? He doesn't end with chords, he ends with single notes, right? Which I think always kind of make a, they kind of give you a, a little bit of a question mark at the end, you know what I mean? And, and it also flushes out the texture, you know? Uh, so anyway, just something to, to kind of notice uh, the, the lack of chords at the end of these pieces. Um, variation two, also on one clavier. I think when I play it, I go up to the upper keyboard just for a change of color. Notice it's the first change of meters, the first time we're out of three, right? Or in duple. Um, and it almost like it hints at being a canon. This, it's not a canon. We're going to get to the canons, right? But it, it, canon means, you know, strictly imitated. But look, look at the, how these parts right here, this little, you know, ba, ba, da, 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 there it is up on top, da, 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 da. but it's more just the two parts winding around each other, obligato style. Um, but you could also say it's forecasting what is to come, which are the strict canons that happen every three pieces. I didn't say that at the beginning, but I should pause and say it now. The Goldbergs, you know, Bach sets the, the course with this, that you have two pieces in, in relatively freestyle, the second one is always the more, more virtuoso, um, or almost always. And then the third one is a canon. And as you progress through the piece with can variation three, variation six, variation nine, variation 12, every third variation being a canon, right? It's at expanding interval. The first canon will be at the unison. The second canon will be at the second. The third will be at the third and so forth. So, um, you know, we'll watch for that. But what I was getting at here is that he's hinting at cannons, even though he hasn't jumped in the pool at this point. Here's variation three is the first cannon. The word cannon is something to kind of pause and, and wonder at. It comes, it, it's, you know, canonic as in, you know, religious uh, canon. Uh, it, it comes from law. It means uh, that the imitation cannot be altered or adjusted in any way whatsoever. It has to be strict. Okay, and these Goldberg cannons are as strict as you could possibly be. Um, you know, Bach just loved this, especially as he got older. He loved writing cannons. The, the, the musical offering is just filled with them. Um, that where the ultimate test is, can you create something that can imitate itself out of phase with itself without causing train wrecks, right? And not only not causing train wrecks, but add up rhetorically to something that's very satisfying and goes somewhere. So, you know, we always say the space shuttle wiring may be complicated. This is a lot more complicated. <laughs> so, you know, um, anyway, as far as, you know, it's one thing to just make it work on paper. It's another to have it go somewhere. That's what, that's what nobody understands. So anyway, Canon One at the unison. Uh, and I'll just kind of walk through this a little bit. We won't do them all. Here's the melody, right? And it's a long note with this little trickle that comes off and it walks down. Here's the imitation. The imitation is this G right here. Okay. It's the same, right? And it has an up stem. Okay. Actually, I hope it's an up stem. Excuse me. No, I'm sorry. What am I saying? Take it. Let's start over. The imitation is the B, right? The G is the first melody going on. The imitation is the down stem of the B, okay? And there is, this is exactly that you heard over here, okay? And then this G leaping up to G, that's the primary melody going on, okay? Does everybody see it? No? The, 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 it's a two-part canon. Other interesting thing to notice about this is that all the canons, except for the canon at the ninth, have an accompaniment bass line or an obligato, so usually underneath them, like that. That is, this cello player down here is just having a good time laying out broken chords and running scales and all of that. And it's incredibly intricate what's going on in the other part, but it has nothing to do with the canon, only in that it supports it melodically and harmonically. Right, but it's just an added feature. So, you know, in in a way, he's making it almost hard to hear the cannons. You know, they're there, but but there's so much activity in the other part that 
the canonic feature of it is not really put out front so much until you get to the one at the ninth. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, it, I, I love it. That, and of course, it just, it just rolls. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful variation. Um, and, and quite, you know, with just a single note down here. Variation four is the kind of the first hint of where we're going to end up at variation 30. It's this first, almost like an English country dance, William Byrd kind of style, outdoor airiness that the quote Labette variation 30 will pick up on. And Bach hints, this is the first time where he's showing you this kind of, you know, jolly bouncing style, you know, the merry month of May or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that, that is where it's all going to go to in variation 30, which is the last variation before the aria comes back. Um, and this one is super jolly. Um, and again, this is right after the canon. So it's kind of a genre piece um, uh, and follows the same baseline. And then after the genre piece comes the virtuoso piece. Now he's really upping the ante with the crosshand variations. This is one of the hardest ones in the set, variation five. If you can see what the left hand's doing, right? It's the left hand is diving over the right and then back down into the hole and then up over the right and et cetera like that. I think Glenn Gould plays this faster than anyone has ever before or since in his in his 1950 recording, right? And of course, you can hear every note. So uh, anyway, uh, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but it's the great it's one of the great circus stunts ever, <laughs> ever done. Um, so anyway, thank you, Glenn. Anyway, um, and you can see, I mean, look at some of this writing. It's just a lot of, a lot of this is just bluegrass fiddling, like right here. This is just down country, country music, right? Ended up in the Appalachians and we all, we still have it. But isn't it, it's remarkably uh, folksy at this point. Variation, uh, just walk through a little bit more. Here's can, uh, number six, which is the canon at the second. I always, I mean, if you think about it, yeah, remember cannons are like row, row, row your boat or something like that. Can you imagine trying row, row, row your boat where one group started on C and the other group started on D, you know, in the imitation? I mean, it, it's a, so, so Bach, when he's writing a cannon where the imitation has to be at the interval of a second, it's gotta be so constructed that, you know, it's gonna make music and create the, the crunches at the right point. So can you kind of see what he's up to here? He gives you a long G, right? And then here comes the imitation. It's the A that a second above the G that smashes in on top of it, Corelli style, right? Then the G falls away and then the A, the, the A falls away and kind of chases it. And of course he gives himself some leeway. He doesn't generally have busyness in one voice and busyness in the other voice like that. That said, look what happened as you get over here. Here it is, right? Third line. Here they are, run, you know, running from uh, contrary motion from each other like that. Um, and then one of the most the, one of the most inspired moments here. This G sharp comes out of nowhere. <laughs> it, it is the most audacious note ever. And I, why it doesn't just the whole wreck the whole variation set, I don't know. I have no idea how he's in, made you anticipate it, but even though it's audacious, it doesn't ruin everything. It just makes it more exciting. And then that gets played out even further in this, in this last line. So that's the canon at the second. Um, that is then followed by this uh, called a Siciliano, which is a Sicilian style, your little dotted, six, eight dotted rhythm, bop, 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 bop. Ba, 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 ba. Um, and Bach actually in his exemplar where he got his copy back, I think he wrote a quick, made sure that you don't play this too slow. Uh, he put a word in and says, you know, don't drag this out, right? Um, so anyway, it should be sprightly. Notice up here, it says one or two claviers, right? You can play this on one manual or on two manuals of the harpsichord. Um, and I, it sounds really nice on mixed manual. I play it on one hand on one, one hand to the other. Anyway, you can, you can, and of course, anybody, if you're listening, you'll add ornaments here and there. It's just, it's asking for it. Hopefully they're the right ones. We know Bob got a little mad when people would ornament in a stupid way, but <laughs> there it is. Um, variation eight. 
No, if if you know Scarlatti's virtuosity, you know that that some of the SOGC uh, is very similar to this kind of writing. Um, it, if you were ever taught to not put your thumbs or your pinkies on black notes, it's like you have to check that at the door once. In, and I think for most of Bach, really, but just just, just your thumbs, you're going to end up all over the black notes. You have to if you're going to hold your fingering patterns. And for what it's worth, at least for, for me, I over the years, I learned this 12 years ago, I relearned it this last year. I, I finger every note and I, I use, I've changed probably every fingering several times. So for, you know, I mean, you know, they, not every one of them, but just they morph, you know. Um, so not every keyboardist works like that, but I, I find I can't, I cannot play it unless I do it. Right. So Anyway, it's very interesting, and it's it's a lovely little thing. Yeah, I did notice he has these. You know, here we are in the second half here, where the the parts are these these little kind of they're a little like mercury on a piece of cardboard. They're little globs just working their way across the surface like that, and he's got them coming toward each other. And notice that the parts cross each other. You see, the left hand ranges up into the treble clef, and the right hand ranges down below the left hand so that the hand the hands are, are working their way across each other it's very it's kind of you know sci-fi a little bit it's very it's very it's very odd sounding and odd looking i think um but always beautiful um one of the most in touching variations in the entire set is number nine this is canon at the third um just heartbreakingly uh tender uh, it's a. Uh, I always think you know the Rembr If you if you know this variation, uh, let's see if I can screen. I'll try to switch. Let's see if we can get, go to artwork. I'll never get back. This one. This one. Can you see the Rembrandt here? Everybody see this right? This is a. It's. I don't know where the, I saw it out in California at the Huntington, but. This is a. This is you know. It is love itself, right? Um, this portrait of this young woman uh, and consummate skill of the artist in rendering it at the same time. But but I I think in the tender variations of the Goldbergs, it's a very. It's the same thing about life. He wants to tell you, right? Um, the intersection between art and love. So anyway, we'll come back to these if <laughs> if I can get back. Um, all right, we're back. 10 is a kind of romperama fugetta, right? This can be done, uh, play kind of as loud and as brusque as you like. I mean, it can be done intimately too, but most people play it very aggressively. Uh, it's lots of fun. And again, a little bit like the quote Labette that's going to come at the end. You know, um, uh, it's a very, almost a very outdoorsy feeling, feeling of a lot of people singing in a rather maybe raw way you know, uh, and having a good time. And yes, there's probably alcohol involved. Um, anyway, so, and that, this is a fugue, but not a canon, right? It's a kind of a light fugetta, kind of a light fugue uh, in that. Now we're in the in the virtuoso crosshand piece. Those, remember, we're following the pattern again of, of genre piece, uh, kind of a virtuoso, a lighter movement piece with lots of crosshands, and then another canon. So he's, all, he's always in this triple formation. Also notice that there's not been one dark piece yet, right? Uh, there are several dark pieces coming, but as you're going through the first 10, 11 of the variations, they're almost all kind of light and positive uh, and, and, and you know, full of sunshine. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one. All sorts of uh, very uh, Duke Ellington-like moments here uh, and, and strange diminished chords, uh, this right here. This is this is some of the most unusual sounds you can get out of out of a keyboard. Uh, and Bach again, he does it so smoothly that you don't really say, "Well, God, that sounds like Duke Ellington." But if you take it out of context, it does sound like Duke Ellington. So anyway, I challenge you. Um, can't now. Now he goes into. I think. I think this is this is the uh, divergence point. This is the fir first canon that does is that inversion. This is the canon at the fourth, 
the fourth, the interval of the fourth, of course, was always seen as a very kind of a glassy and an unstable, but a very interesting interval being the inversion of the fifth. But if you ever play something just in fourth, you know, it, it almost sounds like there's no fundamental or something. And he takes this cannon and he runs it uh, as an inversion cannon. Can you everybody see the theme here? Ba -da -dum, ba -da 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 -dum. And here's the here's the answer. Ba -da -da, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -bum, like that. So that it runs upside down and they they chase each other at one measure apart throughout the piece. As he gets down to the bottom of the first page toward the end of the first section, you start to get uh, some amazingly modern chords, almost Aaron Copeland Appalachian Spring, where you have senses of tonic and dominant being stacked very lightly on top of each other. Um, and, and, and the way, you know, Copeland knew exactly how to, what he could get with that in Appalachian Spring. Yet when, when you have tonic and dominant, you know, that, that is the, the home and the distance from home simultaneously you have a, a beautiful sense of momentary stasis um you know where where all is one and one is all uh, and uh, bach touches on that in an amazing way right here and other places too but if you ever get go read these you'll notice this is a particularly interesting moment and uh makes time stand still and you're, you're always sorry to have to go on uh anyway and then if, if that the this is an interesting variation because he uses it, I think, to kind of uh, become more interior or more tender. Notice that it ends rather low down here with this little walking up the arpeggio and the seventh. And he's setting up the, fir the first time we've gone back to the opening aria in, in intimacy like that, which is variation 13. Uh, which he says is for two uh, keyboards with the left hand on the on, you know, probably on the lower keyboard, the right hand on the more nasal uh, upper keyboard, uh, perhaps, and uh, a gorgeous elaborate melody with you know we always say these are sight reading nightmares for young folk, right? It's like you know what kind of notes are those, right? Are they thirty seconds, sixty fourth, hundred seconds, right? Yeah, I know, but 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 what Bach is doing is he's writing out what you know, jazz musicians and great improvisers are still doing. You've got, you've got your basic slow harmonic motion, you know, and on top of that, in incredibly intricate lace work weaves of scales, you know, arpeggios, you know, skipping thirds, syncopations. Look, look at these incredible syncopations. Like that. Um, and Again, taken out of context, if you if you put just a little more vinegar into this, it's so close to Charlie Parker. You know, it's, yeah, it, it that, that is the sense of in of endless invention, right, within a given structure, like is what I think Charlie Parker did so brilliantly in the 1940s and 50s. So anyway, be another whole nother lecture, Bach and Charlie Parker still jamming in heaven but anyway um so I, I just wanted to point that out uh, uh the beautiful sense of improvisation and i think bach is one of the only composers who really, truly looks wonderful on paper too you know i always yeah, i'm doing a lot of scarlatti right now and i always think scarlatti looks a kind of not very i don't like it on paper as soon as you play it it's incredible right but bach actually it's something on paper as well for for whatever it's worth um it just it, maybe it's it's something about the the way the shapes flow off of each other but we're almost to the midpoint and I, of course i'm not going to do area variation in it but i do want to get us to the midpoint at least um variation 14 after that tenderness of 13 he explodes into perhaps the most raucous of all with the hand the right hand leaping two and three and maybe even four octaves sometimes you know over this running left hand like that and then notice i mean this this language it's kind of boop and then almost these burping things and when that is done then he gets the two squirrels chasing each other around the tree over here. It, it's, it's, it is art music, but it's no different than Mickey Mouse in the 1930s as far as, as far as what, you know, the kind of feeling of it. It's just, you know, very small animals 
incredible buzzed out of their mind, you know. Um, and anyway, lots and lots of fun. Um, and then and then he uh, he brings it kind of brings it all together where you know you, you have these figures and then at the bottom the two parts kind of jump apart. They're almost like facing off like that in this formation down here at the bottom of the page. It's really, really fun. Um, a little bit hard to play, but uh, at least to get it to speak. It, it's very, notice, I'm kind of, I hope I'm pointing out and that we're getting that he's spreading the frame. If you look at 12 was the at the fourth, with all that mysterious tonic and dominant at the same time. 13 was an aria even more elaborate than the opening aria. 14 was the highest energy, you know, uh, uh, Looney Tunes cartoon. And then 15, he goes completely the other way into an almost, you know, fifth century druidic, you know, uh, uh, moment here. I mean, this is so incredibly intense and, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, it's just dark. It's a, it's kind of like nine months of winter at this point here. And this is the canon at, this is canon at the fifth. And like the canon at the fourth, he does it in inver inversion. You start with a, a, a sobbing, falling line fall in G minor. And it's the first time we've gone into minor. Um, and then that's answered by a rising line. Um, and it's full of some of the most incredible dissonances that, that he ever writes. Um, and when you get to the end of it, the imitation leave, leaves it so that the, the high, you go to a box highest note, which is this D and it's, un, and it's unsupported. There's, there's nothing, you know, it just floats off into outer space. We always say it's the, what is it? The, the, the probe, you know, at leaving the solar system. It's just, you know, one beep left you know <laughs> that's it so anyway very end, and that is the end of part one Bach does not say end of part one but it's you definitely need an emotional break at this point and he when he returns he returns with an overture which is a signal that, that you know of a new beginning this type of style was often used at the beginning of plays or of suites and things like that um I was reading it that in an old rhetorical style when you're giving a very long speech there's always a point at the middle of the speech where you're supposed to kind of go over you know where you are called the inner exordium uh it's it's a, it's kind of a way of reviewing where you left the drama and so that's i think that's what bach is doing here with and this is very much in the french overture style it's still the same goldberg's baseline the dropping from the g to the f sharp to the e and to the D and et cetera. It's exactly the same form, but with these very elaborate, we call dotted rhythms. In the 18th century, we know uh, everyone who wrote about how to play said that when you're in this style called the French overture, you exaggerate the dots or you elongate the dots. So it's played bum, brum, ba bum, ba bum, brum, ba bum, ba bum, like that. So, right. And uh, you, you can almost hear the 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 cane hitting the floor you know it's a it's a it's good for sprung wooden floors anyway so it's wonderful and those uh, it, traditionally those give way to a, a imitative fugue like running section um, Handel wrote hundreds and hundreds of these as well and of course the, the French did as as well um, when you get to, now we're you know we're in the the third and fourth act of the Goldbergs he starts to introduce I think even more experimental uh, maybe anticipating modern jazz, 20s, 30s jazz. Look, look at this figure here, running up this seventh chord. boo doo boo doo boo ba bee da ba da bee da ba da ba 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 It could be a jingle. It could be a jingle from 1955, you know? Um, uh, Mr. Sandman, Bring Me a Dream is not far from this. Um, and of course, he puts against it one of the most bizarre figurations, the, this chain of thirds at the same time. Buddha, 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 Buddha. Right. And if you think about those two existing at the same time, I mean, it's, it's really crazy. Um, think, this is why you work out the fingerings, because they're 
fingerings that work and fingerings that don't. Um, anyway, so, but it's, I just wanted to show, uh, also you can hear him nodding to Scarlatti and things like this in the Scarlatti's published pieces, this type of writing. Very few people were writing like this with this, this kind of, you know, walking, fast walking, broken sixths and things, you know, this, it's just, it's kind of a new world for the keyboard in uh, 1740. I think, uh, and uh, they were both exploring it. So lots, lots of fun. Um, seven we got seven minutes, okay. Uh, variation 18, it's a cannon at the sixth. Notice that some of the, the, the cannons are in quick imitation. That is the, the answer comes quickly uh, and others it's quite uh, strung out. Look how tight this one is. Here's the first note, here's the imitation in the same measure like that right and they and they just simply answer each other like two kind of like handbell choir like that uh, and then there's again a free form in the left hand free obligato in the left hand um extremely french style variation 19 very light um a beautiful beautiful piece it always seems shorter than the rest even though he almost always covers the same harmonic ground uh but this one evaporates quickly um, now we get into where uh, br broken patterns where the hands speak one sixteenth note removed from each other, like that. Boom, 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 kind of a raindrop effect. Boom, 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 like that. And then I, I love his his daring in the midst of all that after he's worked through it eight measures, right here. Doodle, 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 you know, it's a I, I always get to be, you're witnessing him writing down and successfully writing down a very good jam session, you know, because what does have to do with it's a completely different type of thought and shape of figure and everything else. And, and I think Bob, he wants to show you how it can all work. Um, Perhaps he maybe as he's deeper into the variations and you've absorbed the pattern of the, the harmonic pattern even more, maybe he can do even bolder things because you you have a sense of continuity. So he, he can play with breaking it a little bit more. Um, it's one one possibility. Uh, anyway, it's a it's a, a wonderful variation. And it gets weirder as it goes. If you if you if you know how this sounds over here, it's very fragmented sounding. Then we get to the canon at the seventh, um, another, like the canon at the second. Remember, sevenths and seconds are inversions of each other. Um, it's a very difficult interval to do. Here, you have the theme. It reaches up for its imitation. And a seventh always seems like an octave that didn't quite make it. So it's an, up, it's an upward leap, but it doesn't attain that. So there's, there's kind of a built-in uh, unfulfilled quality in this. So this one really has some uh, juicy harmonic moments as you get down into the second half. And you can see, this is again, why you do your fingering. This right here is so unkeyboard like It can be done, but it's a puzzle, okay? Variation 22 is, sounds incredibly like variation 18, even though it's not a canon. Um, and the, if the Beatles didn't take Here Comes the Sun from this, then I don't know anything. It's amazingly similar to Here Comes the Sun. More Scarlatti, variation 23. Notice uh, it's not a canon, but the two parts are chasing each other rather quickly here, right? The little bubbles just burn, and then the scales run down in thirds. Again, this is all over Scarlatti's uh, SOGC, uh, but uh, this is very, very cute. And then, uh, and then he always breaks it up. Here you get almost with Debussy in the 20th century, this kind of stuff, um, very unusual. Um, again, have a listen to this for just strangeness of texture, right? And uh, I, I think the Goldberg variations actually in many ways do look ahead to 20th century uh, impressionist and jazz figurations. Uh, that this, this type of writing, maybe once in a while, Rameau would stumble into it, but Bach, I think he's inventing it, you know. So have a listen. Canon at the ninth. This is the longest uh, canon as far as the how long it takes before the imitation comes, excuse me, canon at the octave, right? Here's the theme. It takes two full measures before the imitation enters down here like that. So this is very, very spread out like that and very, very kind of open. 
Uh, beautiful. And with more of those feelings like the, the Appalachian Spring, tonic and dominant crushing in on each other right here. Um, when you get to variation 25, so this is the, the variation 25 is the, what the, the nadir of the set. It's the low point. It's, I think it's probably, a, you know, an investigation of death. Um, and it, it has this extremely uh, uh, in your face kind of harmonic progression where you have the melody in G minor. And then in the next measure, the same melody in F minor. That is, it, mo it modulates down a whole step in one measure. You know, uh, you know, and of course it's not a full modulation, but it, it, iterating the same melody down a whole step is just an extremely strange thing to do. And at the climax of this variation, he does it three times. He does it, 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 it going through the ultimate, which is B flat minor. After you, you know, uh, it's over here in part two. Here it is in C minor. B flat minor, and then hinting at A flat minor, but then working his way out of it. These are, of course, the, the darkest of the dark keys. Um, and, and on the harpsichord, with its clarity of pitch, it renders this variation particularly intense. Um, there's something about the dissonances. You know, the, the, the piano has, has dynamics and all of that, but the, the sound is quite smooth on the piano. And it's the problem in a variation like this is that the dissonances, they just don't they don't get to you enough. So in, in my totally biased opinion. Um, and then like in the B minor mass, after you, you have the, the, you know, you have the low point, you get a kind of a resurrection feeling in this next one. Of course, there's no words or anything like that, but this is timpani, trumpets, drums, you know, uh, all, and all ascending lines like that. Um, so there's some, whatever it is, it's a sense of rebirth uh, and a, a beautiful variation. And when Bach got his copy back of these, this variation, he actually added a whole bunch of appoggiaturas in this part. So it, he wrote bum, 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 ba -ba -dum. That is this E gets repeated against it and it goes, and it's in every phrase, right? Which considering how frisky the right hand is, it's super hard to do but it actually gives more joy to the variation. It get the, uh, and he had, it's almost like he'd forgotten to put those appoggiaturas in his copy that he had sent to the publisher to have it, have the plates made. And then he added them back in because they were right, you know? So anyway, I had a great time relearning this very, <laughs> when I saw them. So anyway, Canon at the ninth, this is the last Canon that we'll see. Um, and this is the only Canon in which there is no accompaniment. Uh, it's wide open. Can everybody see that? There's no, there's no, uh, you know, free other part. It's just the two parts at the ninth and a very open, almost a Claude Bowling. Remember Claude Bowling, 1970s? Almost a Claude Bowling French jazz style. Very similar to that. Um, and then you get variation 28, which is uh, maybe a, it's interesting. It has this stat, this written out trill. But uh, versus uh, these be almost bell ringing moments that go on in the in the upper part like that, this is interesting. How that 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 he's he's I think he's setting up the final scene. You have a kind of a a static buzz on the trill, right? But it's a very very high energy piece like that. But th but there's also the in inside of it is this you know, um, you know st stasis point. That was reminds me of Stravin the way Stravinsky generates things in the Rite of Spring. Um, he has a lot of figures like that. And then variation 29 is just as uh, absolute, uh, it's kind of a, I think the, there's a French word, I can't remember it, but uh, it's like art, it's like kind of like an artillery show is what this is, right? But no, but this is kind of, you know, a, a musket volley. Yeah, ba -ba 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 like that. Um, and uh, you, the hands, can, you, he's noticed he says you can play it on one or two keyboards at the same time. Um, but this is, you know, Bach at his highest energy, right? And then, and this all gives way to this, this romping figure between, between the hands, right? And works his way all the way down the keyboard uh, into a super low 
register. Again, on the harpsichord, this sounds really like, you know, you're in a wonderful glistening mud down there. Um, and then, and then, you know, and then it's even, you know, goes a little further through E minor and all of that and gets to the end. And then when we get to variation 30, where it should be the canon at the 10th, um, he breaks the pattern and he writes the word quod libet. Quod libets were a, a German tradition that was, it was a party kind of a thing. And we have an account from Bach's first biographer, Forkel, of, of how quod libets evolved at an annual Bach picnic. He said, he's, he said that the family would gather, they would have, they set up their food and their drink and all of that. And then they would all outdoors, they would all sing a chorale. And then they would start singing popular songs, kind of spinning out of the chorale. Everybody sang. And the popular songs were not nearly so holy as the chorale texts. In fact, there's many of them had kind of racy texts. And then they had ways of stacking those songs on top of each other so that, um, you know, the, you could sing a couple. They knew which songs worked together. And this is what Bach is doing in the Quod Labette here. He's giving you a German folk tune um, right here. This is, I have been away from you so long. Okay. Ich, ich bin so lang dir bei, nicht bei dir gewest, right? Yeah. Right. And, and then up here, starting right on this G with the stem down, you have beets and cabbages have driven me away. So, right, so, so, all right, so I, so I, and, and there's a couple of things. I've been away from you so long. I, it, it could be the aria that's talking, right? Or it could just be, it's time to just come home like that, right? Uh, and, but it, but it was beets and cabbages and the, the gastro problems or whatever that pushed me away. Um, and then these two, these two run together in a beautiful thing. And then there's a little tag at the end, which is a, a kind of a cryptic one, but, the words to it are, if my mother had cooked meat, I could have stayed longer. That, and that is actually the last thing you hear, um, uh, are that. And of course, Bach and his friends would have known that. It's still a contrapuntally intricate piece like a canon, but it's not a canon. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a mashup, right? Isn't that what they call it? Mashup, right. Um, and I think, you know, if, you know Bach, the, there's, there was the time, you know, for partying, uh, time for studying, but you, you had to know when to quit, right? And this, this, this quote Labette here is, is, I think, his way of saying it, it's maybe time to hang up your hat uh, and relax a little bit and enjoy these great folk tunes and blah, blah, blah. And then the aria comes back. It's really interesting it, just to mess with the Goldberg variations. People have noticed that you could play the variations in many different orders and you still have a wonderful piece. You could, you know, you could almost like take 30 cards and shuffle them and, you know, and, and play, I'll play them in this order. You would still have a great piece. But when you play it in the order that he sets it in, it's, it's of course even more remarkable. It builds to a great drama at the end. And just for fun, try playing it and take out, that is go from variation 29 skip the quod libet and go right back to the aria at the end. It really, really sounds not good. You know, I mean, it just sounds cheap like that. You could also, you know, do the, it, uh, what I'm just, I'm getting at is that the quod libet, I think is the only piece which some, which makes the aria make sense when you come back. Um, and it's beyond my powers of, of analysis to figure out why, but I, I know the order it, it is, it's important, right? Um, and this this feeling of throwing your hat in the air here in, in this in this very in quote Labette was very, very important. You can go on bachcantatas.com and get a wonderful analysis of this, where you can see the words to the songs printed on top of these notes and all of that, you know, so you, you can see all of that. Um, and then when you go back to the aria, it's it is, I mean, it is like going home and knowing the place for the first time. And I was going to try to show you, um, let's try this. Just, just in conclusion, let's see, how do I, couple of things. So, you know, T.S. Eliot put it very nicely in the end of the four quartets. He says, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all of our, our exploring will be to arrive where we started 
and know the place for the first time. Um, which I always is a love is a lovely way to put it. Um, he said, "We uh, through the unknown remembered gate when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree." Um, anyway, so uh, I there's something about coming back to the beginning and seeing it uh, afresh, which I, I think the Goldbergs explores beautifully. Another thing I want to just point out is that maybe just food for thought is Bach's relationship between complexity and simplicity. Um, and we talked about that before with the idea that Debussy brought up, which was that uh, in Bach, no matter how complex it is, the, the thrust of the idea is never lost. There was a French scientist who died uh, 1912. His name, I don't want to butcher his name, but you can see it here, right? I hope. Um, and he, he wrote about this relationship between complexity and simplicity. He says, sometimes simplicity hides under complex appearances, and sometimes it is the simplicity which is apparent and which disguises extremely complicated realities. He says, no doubt, um, if our means of investigation become should become more and more penetrating, we should discover the simple under the complex, then the complex under the simple, then again the simple under the complex, and so on, without our ab being able to foresee what will be the last term. We must stop somewhere. We must stop when we have found simplicity. I know it's, it's very seldom. No, I don't know too many scientists that write like that anymore, you know. Um, Anyway, so that's a one. It's a wonderful phrase. Um, there, and now we're back. I can see you all. So I, I hope that shed some light on it. How about some? I know I went too long, but how, any questions? We'll take one or two. I'm just gonna uh, go back into the chat. Yeah. Where people had written some. Yeah, let's see. Oh, I, maybe I could pull them up. Let's yeah, see. So Martha had a question because you were talking about the 14 canons that were yep. there and she wanted to, she had a question about that, if you can see it. Are the 14 new ones part of what we think of as the Goldberg? So, so uh, no, the 14 canons are, they're not. And nor, nor do we think Bach was saying, put these in. I think he just wanted to make sure that they were <laughs> in the same drawer, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, so, that kind of thing. So, uh you know, so no, and, and, but you can listen to you. You can, they're published. Uh, you can get them uh, for chamber ensemble. You can get them for you know a keyboard version, and uh, you know. So anyway, so I don't think he intended them to to go with the set, but you know he was always cooking up something new. I mean, when you introduce those canons, that it would expand the Goldbergs into much more of something like the musical offering, where it becomes you know this giant buffet of various canons and things like that. So that's the way the musical offering is structured. So who knows? Um, anyway, and, whoa, I lost you. What, what's another question? That was the only one that was uh, written down. Are there any, I mean, I have one, if I can. Yeah, I, Linda Clifford uh, was, yes, Rembrandt. I like that, right. Yeah. And that's, that's my critical response too. It's like, yes, Rembrandt. I know, I, it, what a painting that is. Yeah, any, but other questions or things to observe? I have a question. So we know that Bach was an amazing improviser. Mm -hmm. We know that he performed, he went around performing. How close do you think the written version that we have of Goldberg Variations, how close to, is that to what he would have performed if he were yeah. performing it live? You know, I would actually have to say in, incredibly not close. Right. I, I think he was such a boiling pot of ideas. I don't think it was ever the same from day to day. <laughs> but, but that said, he still believe, knew that when he was publishing it, that he had to present it in a form that made sense that day, you know? <laughs> um, you know, no, I, as a whole that, you know, but uh, I, I, you know, just based upon the way he was, he was always working with things, he just could not stop messing with things, you know, um, and probably some of those canons at the end, he probably would have found a way to weave those into material that we know as part of the Goldbergs. I mean, you know, we know he was capable of playing three and four things at the same time and making it make sense. So God, God, I mean, oh, oh for a five minute take, right? But it's, it's a great question. So my guess is no, 
he, it, I don't think with him anything was ever fossilized, you know. Right. So all the pieces that we have of him, anything that he would have performed, right. the written form we have is in just an approximation of like a, a, a yeah. snapshot of him in motion. Yeah. What he might have yeah. performed on any one day. One and one thing I forgot to say is that you know Bach was at other pieces he was toying with this idea. You know, if you look at Cantata Four or something like that, which is based Christ on a single chorale, Chris Log and Todas London. Um, right at the end, at the end he shows you the chorale, the 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 you know the consolidated version, the tight version of what has been shown all the variations have come before it and then you see the chiseled version at the end and he does that in several other cantatas it's sort of like what's the goldbergs except that he shows it to you on either end in the goldbergs okay um and also in the b minor mass the gracias agimos tb which is movement seven of the b minor mass is then comes back at the very end an hour and a half later as the final movement with new words you know uh for the the you know the the lamb of what's the words to at the end don't know he's him at the end right so anyway so he was investigating i think he was investigating cyclic form you know other places as well even the well-tempered clavier going from c major all the way through b minor and then he writes book two back to c major in a new i i think he was fascinated with it any other questions or comments no nothing are we are we set everyone went, we're gonna go outside <laughs> we have a neighborhood bonfire we're gonna go to our party so i think i'll go to that well, nothing else good yeah. feel free to unmute and and yeah um yeah. i don't know if i can ask this of course um well because i'm not a trained musician or anything but you said something about you like the harpsichord um sound you uh -huh. think that's more what he had in mind in I forget which variation. Well, yeah, well, I mean, just you know, at a very fundamental level. So he he actually said on the title page it is for harpsichord. So it's one of the few pieces where he didn't. It wasn't ambiguous. He just said this is written for two manual harpsichord. But I was saying about that particular variation, the clarity in, in variation yeah. twenty five, which is a uh, very dark. Uh, has a lot of minor seconds and dissonances in it, which on the harpsichord are quite poignant sounding. Uh, the, the clarity of the pitch makes dissonances more intense, you know. Uh, at the piano has a very wide kind of sound. So the same minor seconds are have, they're almost smoother in quality, right? And it all depends on what you like, right? But I, I like the pun, I think the pungency as an actor, <laughs> that hits me better, you know, for, for what scene I'm trying to create than the smoothness of the piano. Well, that, that just, yeah, that brought, the other day, I can't even tell you what I was listening to, but it was a, a, a wind instrument and uh, a piano. And I thought the piano was the wrong, it took away from the wind could, instrument. Yeah. So I just wondered if Bach had that in his. In his and of course, piece. piano pianos were there were a few pianos around when Bach wrote the Goldbergs early pianos. They sounded very different yeah. from the modern. They're 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 more like a hybrid between a harpsichord and a modern piano, and in a way. But uh, so anyway, that's a that's a for me for another. It's another evening. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, guys? I have a few notes that I took. Oh, good. I like that. <laughs> Let me check my notes. Good. You can. Thank you so much. And you know, one of these days we'll do. Maybe soon we'll do. We'll do a Goldberg's in person. You know. Oh, cool. In a nice space. Okay. Everybody, stay safe and, and enjoy your spring and summer. Thank you for asking. Thanks, Thanks Trevor. Bye -bye. Thank you, Trevor. Bye -bye. Good luck with your festival. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you Thanks so much. Friend. Thank you. We really appreciate having this lecture be part of the of the festival, Trevor. It was wonderful yeah. to have My you. My pleasure. Here. And um, it will it is recorded, and I will be posting this uh, on the website on the BATC website. So it'll be up for at least the length of the festival. If if you want to hear it again, or if friends who were not able to to watch. Yeah. So so Perfect. thank you all for attending also and uh, witnessing this wonderful. Uh, uh, explosion of ideas transmitted to us.
about Bach by Trevor. So <laughs> love it. Thanks. Thank you, Marika. Yeah. Thank you, for, thank you all for organizing it. Thank you and Betty and, and everybody else. Good night. Thank you, Trevor. Bye-bye. Right. Good night. Bye-bye.